Whether you have come here tonight as a supporter of the political arguments that I'm going to be making, whether you've come here as in this Church of God as an agnostic on these matters, even if you've come here with animus in your heart, I hope that we can have a civilized evening of debate and argument because I believe in that and I have no fear of that because I'm convinced that the arguments that we are making are right. One of the things that struck me when Irene was running through the rather long story of my political life is that on every one of these subjects our point of view was once controversial. Seems a very popular word in Canada. <laughs> I, I have not seen my name in print except prefaced by the word controversial. <laughs> well, I don't shirk from that because controversy brings argument, brings interest, brings the possibility of changing people's minds, winning them to our point of view. But the one thing about all the controversies that she mentioned is that they are now orthodoxies. Today's controversies are tomorrow's consensus, except it appears in Canada, in Ottawa, in the cabinet room, in the parliament. I'm not described as controversial anywhere in the world except in Canada. And that's one of the areas that I want to explore this evening. But as I gaze around at this absolutely gigantic crowd, I have to say, take a look around, Jason Kenny. Put this in your pipe and smoke it. Because, as any bookseller could have told him, the minute you try to ban a book, it immediately goes into the bestseller list. And our campaign is now in the bestseller list. There is no other campaign that can organize a 12-city tour of Canada and bring literally thousands in this case, more than a thousand people to a public meeting on a cold winter's night. So thank you, up to a point, Mr. Kenny, because you definitely made me famous in Canada. And that's a good thing if it brings people to rallies such as this. But. The price that's been paid for Mr. Kenny's actions is considerable. It is not an easy thing to handle being described in official Canadian government documents publicized around the world that I was not just a supporter of terrorism, but a member, member of a terrorist organization and that I was a threat to Canada's national security. This despite the fact that we discovered in the court process that Canada's security services, who will be here tonight, I'm sure, <laughs> and they're welcome, Canada's security services, in writing, told Jason Kenney and Stephen Harper that this allegation was false, that I was not a member of a terrorist organization and neither was I a threat to Canada's national security. And it would have come as quite a surprise if I had been. It would have come 
as a surprise to Her Majesty the Queen that for 25 years, sitting in her parliament, was a member of a terrorist organization, a threat to the security of a Commonwealth country. It would have come as a surprise to Mr. Speaker that all the while that he was recognizing me as regularly elected the Parliamentary Debater of the Year over and over, that in fact I was sitting with some dangerous weaponry just waiting for the moment to strike. <laughs> it would have come as a surprise to the Bush administration in the United States of America, throughout which I traveled as a public speaker in virtually every state in the Union, it would have come as a surprise to the Canadian security services because, as Irene just told you, I was regularly visiting and speaking in Canada before this absurd and ridiculous but reprehensible pack of lies was told to the Canadian public by its own government. The judge, in a 60-page caning of Jason Kenney, made quite a good movie that, The Caning of Kenney, <laughs> might be X certificate, but who knows what he gets up to in his personal life, and I don't care. In that 60-page caning, it repays reading if you have not read it, the minister is found, is judged, is ruled to have deliberately deceived the people of Canada about the reasons for the ban on my traveling here 18 months ago. On page after page of those 60 pages, the government is found to have bent the laws of Canada in pursuit of their weird, it's the only word for it, weird and bizarre and virtually unique in the world attempt to criminalize support for the Palestinian people. And I must say, I must say, that I cannot think of any democratic country where a minister could be caned over 60 pages in such a way and not have to tender his resignation. I cannot think of any country in which that could be true. I can't think of a country where if he didn't tender his resignation, the Prime Minister would have sacked him. But then the Prime Minister could not have sacked him because, as becomes clear in the court discovery process, if you'll forgive the phrase, I know I'm getting into deep waters, Harper was in bed with Kenny on this whole miserable affair. Absolutely entwined with Kenny in this whole miserable affair. He endorsed Kenny's action. And this leads me to a much bigger issue than my own fate at the hands of these people. Because my fate at the hands of these people is nowhere near as important as your fate at the hands of these people. What is it about Canada that it has transformed itself or its government has transformed the country's image in this way. I'm old enough to know of the time when Canada was admired, even loved in the world, as a peaceful place, as a place that looked to resolve conflicts rather than join them. I'm old enough to remember when those brave Americans who refused to participate in the barbaric assault on the people of Vietnam and fled to Canada for haven, safe haven, were welcomed here instead of sent back 
to prison by a government that you have today. It is inconceivable to me how Canada could have allowed its government to reduce this country in the eyes of most of the world to a virtual embassy of the most right-wing government of Israel that we have ever had. Mr. Kenny said, Mr. Harper said rather, just a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I'm quoting him, that Canada is ready to, and I quote, pay any price to support this government of Benjamin Netanyahu. He might have added Kennedy-esque, bear any burden to support this right-wing extremist government in Tel Aviv. Why? What's in that for you? Were you asked if you wanted to pay any price to support Netanyahu's Israel? Is there anything in Canada's national interest to be gained from such a thing? He says, after the trouncing of Canada in the election to the Security Council of the United Nations, that this defeat was a result of Canada's, quote, unstinting support, unquote, for Israel. However, he said, it's a badge of honor. No, Mr. Harper, it's a badge of shame on Canada. It's a badge of shame. And that's how the rest of the world sees it. And what's wrong with the Canadian media that they go along with this so comprehensively? You've been kicked out of the United Arab Emirates. You need to get a visa now if you visit Dubai although it can be dangerous visiting Dubai. There might be a gang of murderers at loose using the stolen passports of friendly countries. Fifty of them might come and murder you in your hotel room because that's what happened in Dubai last year. A gang of murderers using the stolen passports of Britain and Ireland and France and other friendly countries who are never done telling us how friendly they are to Israel. Well, Israel doesn't seem to be very friendly to them when it comes to the theft of their citizens' documents in the commission of murder. You're even now, I know it's off the subject, you're even now picking a fight with Russia, for God's sake, requiring Russian citizens to provide information to the Canadian Immigration Service that would have them imprisoned in Russia if they did give this information. And we saw yesterday in the newspapers a retired Canadian diplomat describe this government's determination to be the last cold warrior standing. That's the problem here, isn't it? That you have a government there is the last Alamo of George W. Bush neocon madness, voodoo, voodoo diplomacy, voodoo politics. Bush is gone. The Bushites are gone south of the border. But they still have a dead end, last ditch rear guard here in Canada. And whilst I wouldn't dream of advising you for whom to vote, I hope when you get the chance, you take it to recover Canada's reputation in the world when that general election comes along. I was in a university, McMaster University, in Hamilton, Ontario yesterday. 700 people came to the meeting. There were no protesters outside, but there were scores of policemen 
armed policemen inside, in the lecture room. And I asked in my speech, are all these policemen here because they think we might do something wrong? Or are they here because someone might do something wrong to us? And if it's the latter, when are we going to hear about that in the Canadian media? Because that's terrorism. The threat to do something wrong to people gathered in a university for a political rally. Instead, it's us who are described as controversial. It's us who are described as sympathetic to violence and terrorism. This is adding insult to injury. I believe in free debate. There are limits to free debate. There are limits set by the laws of libel and defamation. If I were to libel some, someone this evening, it could prove an expensive business, as Jason Kenney is about to find out in the Canadian courts. I know, I know that's a mixed blessing for you as Canadian taxpayers. <laughs> this whole affair has already cost your country a pretty penny, and it's going to cost much more. But the good news is this, every penny, every cent that I win in compensation from the government of Canada and its hirelings in Kenny's office, every cent will be spent here in Canada building an even greater anti-war movement here in this country. And there are all also other barriers that those who advocate free speech must have cognizance of. And they include the prohibition, the just and righteous prohibition of speech which whips up racial or religious hatred. I have never in my life, as a man of the left, since I was a child, I joined the labor movement when I was 13 years old. I've spent all of my life fighting racism and hatred. How could I conceivably be accused of being against Jews? It is as absurd as it is offensive. Marx was a Jew. Trotsky was a Jew. Einstein was a Jew. Epstein was a Jew. Joe Slovo, the hero of the South African liberation movement, was a Jew. There are Jews all over Canada in our campaign for justice for the Palestinian people. There are Jews in Israel itself marching with us. We have nothing. How could we? We have nothing. How could we? We have nothing against Jews. We are against the racist apartheid political system of Zionism as practiced by Netanyahu's Israel today. That's what we are against. I was one of the very few figures on the left sent underground into South Africa as an operative of the African National Congress led by Nelson Mandela, described by President Reagan and Margaret Thatcher as terrorists. I worked underground 
in apartheid South Africa. And every city I went to, every house that I lived in, every car I was driven in, every dinner that I ate, every penny that I spent was provided by Jewish activists of the African National Congress. Jews don't have to be with apartheid. They don't have to be with oppression. They can be and they are with liberation and with freedom. And we honor all of those. Now I have to deal this evening with two great subjects. There may be other interests, preoccupations even, in the hall. Don't worry, I'm ready to answer your questions on anything at all. But the two subjects I'm here to talk about, in addition to this free speech issue, are Afghanistan and Palestine. I see that your government has again broken its promise to the military families, to the military themselves, and to the voters in Canada, having promised you again that you would be withdrawing from this doomed and disastrous, now almost 10-year war in Afghanistan. But of course, your men are only going to be training does nobody in Canada ever ask, how come these Afghan army types need quite so much training? Ten years you've been training them. The training budget of Karzai's army is one billion dollars a month. A month. Twelve billion dollars a year on training. It's bigger than the budget for the whole of the rest of the government. A billion a month on training without any noticeable improvement in 10 years in the performance of this army. 35% of whom, according to the United States, disappear out the back door fully trained and join the Taliban. <laughs> apparently the wages are better. <laughs> really, apparently the wages are better. Well, of course, once Karzai and his drug dealing brother and his warlords have filled their pockets, well, there's not much left to give to the trained soldiers. So they disappear, more than one third of them, and join the Taliban. Nobody's training the Taliban, by the way, and they seem to be doing quite well. <laughs> the idea that 900 Canadian trainers are going to either make any kind of difference to the outcome of this bloody conflict or be safe is ridiculous. Mr. Harper says they'll be behind barbed wire in Kabul. Well, that sounds safe, doesn't it? Nobody is safe anywhere in Afghanistan behind barbed wire or in Kabul or not. The people of Afghanistan have never been successfully occupied by any foreign army. Even Alexander the Great. It's a fact. This is the problem, you see. These political leaders know nothing of history. You can excuse Bush, he was an imbecile. <laughs> but you can't excuse Blair or Harper. They must know that even Alexander the Great did not successfully occupy Afghanistan and Mr. Harper, you ain't no Alexander the Great. <laughs> this war is doomed and everybody knows it. As a matter of fact, we're now practically begging the Taliban to come and negotiate 
a basis for our withdrawal. And they will come and they will negotiate the terms for our withdrawal. The problem is the terms will be the same this year or next year as they were last year or at any year during this 10 years of war, which means we'll be leaving on the same terms we could always have got, which means that all those soldiers gave their life's blood for nothing. And all those Afghans in their thousands, uncounted, nobody count, anybody ever seen a figure for the number of Afghan dead in this war? I remember on the eve of the attack on Afghanistan, George W. Bush's wife and Tony Blair's wife giving a joint transatlantic press conference, kind of synchronized swimming in the grief of the post 9-11 families. They both talked about the obscene death suffered by those American women on those airplanes on 9-11. They both asked us to remember those heartbreaking messages of grief, of farewell, of love sent by those American women from their mobile telephones left on the answering machines of their loved ones. I said at the time, just because Afghan women don't have mobile telephones and their loved ones don't have answering machines, it won't make their deaths delivered from the sky any less obscene than the deaths of those American women on 9-11. It has all been for nothing. Canada lost more soldiers dead as a proportion of their presence in the country than any other country involved in this occupation. And now, Mr. Harper wants you to stay until 2014. I doubt if they'll still be there in 2014. But if they are, it will be at the cost of many lives, both their own and even more at the cost of many Afghan lives. And not just at the cost of those directly involved who fall there. I said, if you'll forgive me quoting myself, four days after 9-11, when the British Parliament was recalled, I said, if we handle this the wrong way, we will create 10,000 new bin Ladens. We have created hundreds of thousands of new bin Ladens. With every murderous attack on a wedding party or any kind of congregation or gathering, every attack from drones or from the highest tech military aircraft, every new massacre in Afghanistan and for that matter in Iraq is recruiting and fanaticizing scores, hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of new, embittered, enraged Muslims who see our double standards, who see what we do rather than hear what we say and become dedicated to harming us, even incinerating themselves in order to harm us. I saw it in my own London constituency on the 7th of July, 7-7, 2005, when 55 Londoners, statistically speaking, almost certainly in their overwhelming majority, having been opposed to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and hundreds of wounded, maimed, 55 dead. I saw them with my eyes being carried, broken, dead, bleeding from the underground stations in London. I said then that afternoon in the parliament, this was a despicable 
crime of mass murder that happened in London today. It is a sin in any religion, a crime in any language, to kill and maim innocent people, to punish guilty people who were all in Glen Eagles as it happened on the day. The difference, I said, between me and you, Mr. Blair, is that I believe killing and maiming innocent people for political purposes is a sin and a crime, whether it's carried out by a man with a beard and a turban in the Tora Bora, or a man in a suit in the White House, or in Whitehall, or in Ottawa, or in Tel Aviv. That's the difference between you and me. These wars are driving more and more people to hate us. They are deepening what I describe as a swamp of bitterness and hatred, sowing it, watering it with new blood with every day in these occupations, in these wars, with this injustice and these double standards. They're always looking for an Islamic organization to blame for the fanaticization that's underway in the Muslim world. Always looking for a cleric to ban or a book to proscribe. But actually, all that a young Muslim in the world today needs to get radicalized is possession of a television and the ability to watch the news. That's what's radicalizing people. What we are doing in these occupations and in these wars. And when we move to the subject of Palestine, we move to the heart of the matter. You see, it may be a matter of no great moment outside in the street to the ordinary citizen in our countries that the Palestinians are the victims of one of the greatest crimes of the 20th century, now bleeding into the 21st. But be sure that amongst the two billion Muslims in the world, it matters a very great deal indeed. When they see us talking about bringing democracy to Afghanistan, democracy to Iraq, whilst we're starving the Palestinians in an illegal siege to punish them for how they voted in the only democratic election ever held in any Arab country ever in history. They know that this is the deepest and rankest hypocrisy. Because that's what this siege is all about. Google it and see. It's not about rockets being fired from Gaza. It's not about the existence of charters. It's about the fact that the Palestinians voted for a party that the powers in the world don't like. Well, let me say something to you. I've said it 10,000 times. Let me say it 10,001. I am not now nor have I ever been a supporter of Hamas. If I had had a vote, I wouldn't have voted for them. If I had a vote, I wouldn't vote for them. I'm not a supporter of Hamas, but I am a supporter of democracy. And nobody has the right, nobody has the right to choose the leadership of the Palestinian people except the Palestinian people themselves. This is A, B, C. This is just common sense. I don't like Stephen Harper, but I can't pretend he's not the Prime Minister of Canada. I can't choose somebody else and call him the Prime Minister of Canada. My God, the vision of Michael Ignatieff just crossed my mind. <laughs> Talk about Tweedledum and Tweedledee. 
or uh, or if I wasn't in a church, I'd say two cheeks of the same backside. <laughs> I can't appoint somebody else as the leader of Canada. Only the Canadians can choose their government. We wouldn't dream of allowing anybody else, would you, to choose your government. Why then do you insist on choosing the government of Palestine? Elected in an election that Jimmy Carter described, and I quote him, as pristine, pristine, crystal, clear, perfect. It was a perfect election. But because we didn't like the result, we immediately imposed a siege on the Palestinian territories, which has now led to starvation, immiseration of 1.6 million Palestinians locked up in what the Prime Minister of Britain, David Cameron, called an open-air prison camp, and not just starved, but as we saw in 22 days, in December and January of 2008, 2009, the besiegers locked all the gates so that the 1.6 million people living in a tiny piece of land, 25 miles long, two and a quarter miles wide, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and then they rained down death and destruction upon them using even illegal weapons. It wasn't enough to drop legal bombs. Using gas, can you believe it? Using gas, white phosphorus gas. I've seen it in action in 1982 when Israel invaded and occupied Lebanon, besieged Beirut, began to reduce it to rubble and ash, I visited the hospitals where the children were breathing white smoke from the white phosphorus that was burning within them. That's what it does when you ingest it. You can't get rid of it. It cooks you. It bakes you to death. And we all saw it live on television, at least if you had access to other than Fox News and CNN and the rest. You saw 1,416 Palestinians killed in 22 days, thousands maimed, 62,000 houses destroyed, which remain destroyed because the siege will not allow in a single brick, hammer, or nail to rebuild them. You may have seen, as I did, the little Palestinian girl held aloft by the ambulance man who had been forbidden to pick up her body for five days, minus her leg and her arm eaten off by the dogs roaming the killing fields of Zaytun a district of Gaza City. You may have seen the parents carrying their dead and mutilated children into hospitals that had no power with doctors without clean coats because they had no detergent, lacking medicine, lacking operating equipment with the electricity going off in the middle of operations, then conducted by candlelight. You may have seen it all you may have been moved by it, but your government supported it from the first day until the last. Shame on them. Shame on them. And have they, have the perpetrators of this siege, this massacre, been punished? They're never punished. They have never been punished. Israel has broken more United Nations Security Council resolutions than all the countries in the world put together. 
They've broken more international law than all the countries in the world put together. Yet, and this is the unkindest cut of all, this is the insult that's added to injury. The Palestinians, who are the victims of terrorism, are called the terrorists, and Israel, who practice the terrorism, are called the victims of terrorism. This insult is unbearable so far as the Muslim world is concerned. Palestine has been wiped off the map. Go to your atlas and see. We're always hearing about threats to wipe Israel off the map, even though nobody has the means to wipe Israel off the map. Though Israel has the means to wipe everybody else off the map, in possession of hundreds of illegally acquired nuclear weapons, which we know, by the way, because the brave Jew Mordechai Vanunu went to prison for 20 years for telling us. The Palestinians are the ones who have been scattered to the four winds, to the four corners of the earth. The lucky ones living here as refugees in Vancouver. The unlucky in their millions living in rancid, rat-infested refugee camps in the Arab countries alongside Palestine. Generation after generation, some of them now there for 62 years. Others for 43 years. Some of them can even see their own houses from their refugee camps. Can you believe it? The Janine refugee camp, one square kilometer, 14,000 families. They all come from Haifa, a shining city on the sea. If they stand on the roof of their shack with a pair of binoculars, they can actually see their own houses, their own gardens being lived in and enjoyed by foreigners who came from Vancouver, where they already had a house, where they already had a life, where no one was persecuting them, where no one was taking any action against them. And they went there and stole the houses of the people who've lived for the last 60 years in this filthy refugee camp, hell. And they call the victims the terrorists. This is intolerable. Israel, on the 31st of May of this year, boarded in international waters a humanitarian aid ship which I co-organized they murdered nine unarmed humanitarian aid workers. They wounded scores of others. They kidnapped hundreds of others, took them in shackles to a jail in the Negev desert, and then robbed them of all their possessions, their computers, their phones, their money, even their clothes, even their underwear. They were given their luggage back empty. Some of the computers turned up on sale in a Jerusalem market a few months later. Just ask yourselves this. If Iran had boarded a humanitarian aid ship in international waters and murdered nine, wounded scores, kidnapped hundreds, we'd all be sitting here with tin hats on because we'd be at war with Iran. But Israel suffered no punishment whatsoever for this crime of piracy in international waters. This double standard is what's driving people in the Muslim world crazy. It's why so many of them are so angry with us that they want to hurt us even if it means ending their own lives in so doing. We have an obligation as human beings or as religious believers, as well as human beings. These issues are all linked together because we are locked in a great confrontation. Huntingdon called it a clash of civilizations, although the idea that George Bush represented any kind of civilization 
was very difficult for me to grasp. I always say to Muslim friends, don't confuse these hypocrites with Christians. Christians believe in the prophets, peace be upon them. Bush and Blair believed in the prophets and how to get a bigger piece of them. That's exactly what they believe in. British people go to the Middle East and ask for Irish passports. They discover Irish grandmothers. My country, the United States, and increasingly your country, are placing themselves in the front ranks of the hated. And there's no future in that for us. There's no future for our children in that. We have to shake ourselves free of the mindset that somebody, God maybe, gave us the right to go around the world invading other people's countries and occupying them. I hate, as a person of Irish background, anything called empire. Once I came home and told my Irish grandfather that the teacher said that Britain had an empire so vast that upon it the sun never set. And my grandfather answered, that's because God would never trust the British in the dark. <laughs> and I never had cause to doubt that. I don't want to live in a country that's occupying other people's countries. I don't want to live in a country whose government is making people hate me, making people hate and endanger my children and their children. We have to shake ourselves out of the mindset that we have the right to impose political systems or political leaders on other people, which we would never for a moment dream of accepting for ourselves. We are not the special ones. Nobody chose us for this destiny. We have to be prepared to deal with people wherever they are in the world as equals, equal of us. And for those of us who call themselves progressives, I close with the words of a great hero of mine in whose army I march. Commandante Che Guevara said, the man who is not capable of trembling with indignation at injustice visited upon anyone anywhere is not a man at all. I ask you to tremble with indignation at the fate of the people of Palestine, at the crimes being committed in our name around the world. Wassalamu alaikum. Peace be on all of you. Thank you very much. If you're a regular watcher, as you say you are, of my two television programs a week on Press TV, you will not be able to adduce a single comment that I have ever made, a single statement I have ever spoken, from which I resile or about which I'm embarrassed, still less ashamed. I don't say one thing in one place and a different thing in another place. I have regularly, if you're a regular viewer, you may acknowledge this, I have regularly criticized aspects of the governance of Iran live on Iranian TV. Not many people have done that. But I have done it. And if they stopped me doing it, I'd stop presenting the programs. I write my own words, if I write them at all, or they come from my own head and my own heart. I think there are many aspects of life in Iran, in the Islamic Republic, uh, which are bad. I'm sure that there were flaws, big flaws, in the Iranian presidential election. But at least Iran has an election 
who elected the kings of Arabia in all the countries next door to Iran? Nobody elected them. Now you might say that's a non sequitur, but it isn't because the kings of Arabia are our best friends. It doesn't matter that they don't have elections. It doesn't matter they don't have any freedoms at all. You will never read in the Canadian newspapers a sustained critique of the fact that the king of Saudi Arabia has never been elected by anyone, flawed or otherwise. But you will never end reading about the imperfections in Iran's election. Be careful and film every word of this. It's very important that you don't misrepresent what I'm saying. I'm saying that Iran has had 10 presidential elections. That's 10 more than most of the Arab countries of which we are the closest allies. So this has to be kept in perspective. It's true that people are executed in Iran. I'm busily trying to stop the execution of some of them. No, don't thank me. It's my duty to do that. I'm against the death penalty in any country, anywhere, at any time. The point I'm making is that we hear lots about executions in Iran, whilst in Saudi Arabia, every Friday afternoon, in a public square, someone is getting their head cut off, and we never hear anything about that. Why? The answer, if you're a sentient human being, is this. They want to persuade us into hostility, maybe even war against Iran, and they want us to support our continued friendship and alliance with Saudi Arabia and other dictatorships like it. All I say is this. I'm ready to fight for the rights of anyone, anywhere. I closed my speech by saying it. But I'm not ready to ally with those who all the while protesting they don't want a war on their country are actually in league with people who are preparing to make war on their people. I've been there before. I've seen that movie before. <laughs> Irene, Irene and I, in our long campaign against sanctions and war on Iraq, were forever coming across Iraqi opposition groups that were trying to get us to join the crescendo of hostility against their own country, all the while protesting that they didn't want to see their country invaded. But they did want to see their country invaded. They collaborated in the invasion of their own country, and they're now filling their pockets in the puppet regime in Baghdad, as we always suspected that they would. So, don't ask me. Ask me to support liberty in Iran. But don't ask me to support war against Iran because I'll give my last breath against war on Iran. Well, of course, I, uh, I did spend 60 minutes, uh, I think, uh, speaking as well as I could about the background to all of this. The Muslims have to do, I think, three key things. First of all, they must be clear in their rejection of terrorism. This is important. They must be clear that they regard it as a sin, as a crime, to, to harm innocent people, for the crimes of guilty people. I'm unequivocal about that. You know, in that speech I told you about four days after 9-11, I said to the Tory front bench, I said, I despise Osama bin Laden, a medieval obscurantist savage. 
The difference is, I always despised Osama bin Laden. I despised him when you were giving him guns and money and diplomatic and political support. The second thing Muslims have to do is to make alliances with non-Muslims who are just as angry as they are. And to be welcoming and work in such a way as to make those alliances possible and bigger and more powerful all the time. We have, if I may say so, in Britain achieved a model of cooperation between the Muslims and the left, which is an example that I would commend to the world. In France, just 22 miles away, the Muslims and the left are entirely separate from each other. Even though there are more Muslims in France than any other European country, and more leftists in France than in any other European country, both of them are weaker because they don't unite together, indeed are locked in some regards in hostility with each other. So the Muslims have to look for allies because the Muslims in a Western country are always going to be a minority, a very small minority, and can never successfully defend themselves, never mind advance their agenda alone. So separatism and extremism have to be eschewed by the Muslims in Canada and in uh, North America. But the third thing, here I address the Muslims here, the third thing is the hardest thing, but it's the most important thing. You have to refuse to be intimidated. You have to refuse to be frightened out of political activity. And you have to stop cringing to the hand that strikes you. I learned two days ago that Arabs in Montreal held a fundraising dinner for Jason Kenney, a hundred dollars a plate, raising 60 or 70 thousand dollars for a man who spends his life hitting Arabs and Muslims. This is a kind of madness. The idea that you should cringe before such a man is completely un-Islamic. It is a commandment in Islam to speak up and stand up against tyranny and injustice. Muslims should not be afraid. Personally, I'm afraid of no one. I'm afraid only of God and the Judgment Day. And on that Judgment Day, I will have to answer for what I did and what I didn't do.